Hello, 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 students. Welcome back for our topic this week. And uh, as you know, yesterday we started to talk about cell processes, the things that take place within the cell. Again, last week we was all about structures. This week it's all about the activities, the cell processes. And if you recall, last time we met, we finished off with the two kinds of respiration. And in particular, our last slide from last time was anaerobic respiration, also known as fermentation. Very good. So today, let's pick it up where we left off, and let's go to number three. Number three is called diffusion. Diffusion is number three. Now, in a general sense, diffusion is the movement of something from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. That's the, the basic gist of diffusion, is the movement of something from higher to lower concentration levels. I want to demonstrate this in a, in a few different ways, in a few different ways. Let's start with, as you're copying that down, let, let's start with a red ball. I have a red ball here, and I am bringing it up to a higher location. If I were to let go of this ball, what is going to happen to it, everybody? Yeah, it's going to fall. It's going to go to a lower place. Things in nature always tend to go from a higher state to a lower state, from high to low, uh, in order to achieve what's called stability. But things always in nature go from high to low. Likewise in cells. Things in cells move from higher concentrations to lower concentrations, and we call that diffusion. In fact, our lab activity is, tomorrow is going to, uh, to really unpack diffusion a lot more. But uh, there, there's something interesting about diffusion. You see, diffusion does not require any energy input. Diffusion requires no energy input. In other words, it just kind of happens by itself. The ball, I didn't have to throw the ball down. I didn't have to add any energy to it. I just had to release it. And when you release the ball, gravity does all the work. It goes from high to low. Let me try and illustrate this in a slightly different but related way. So let's go over to a close-up view in the lab and let's work with a piece of wood. All right, here I have a, uh, a flat piece of wood. And on this piece of wood, I'm going to place my little Tonka Jeep. <laughs> yeah, I love toys. Wait until next year, by the way. Eighth grade science is all about playing with toys just so you know. But here I have a little Tonka truck on one side of this piece of wood. Now, what could I do to this piece of wood to get the Tonka truck to go from here to here? Yeah, I could change this piece of wood and, and raise this piece of wood. Yes, I know I could push the Tonka truck from one side to another. But what could I do to the piece of wood? Well, if I were to raise this piece of wood so that this side is higher and this side is lower, and I let go of the truck, where is the truck gonna go? 
it's going to go from high to low. Now, did I have to push the truck? No. Did I have to fuel up the truck? No. It just happens because gravity is pulling everything down and this truck is going from an area of a high location to an area of lower location. Because in nature, again, things go from high to low, from high to low. So think of these two analogies as we head back to our notes for a moment. Remembering that diffusion requires no energy input. In the case of both the truck and the ball, they simply go from high to low. No energy input is required at all. There's a couple more examples that I'd like to give you here regarding diffusion. <laughs> Have any of you ever had a little oops moment? Maybe you had a little too much Taco Bell for dinner the night before and you're sitting in class perhaps and oh my, the rumblies in your tumbly start moving lower and lower until you just cannot contain the waste gases anymore and oops. Now, have you ever heard of an SBD? It's a technical term. S B D. Do you know what it stands for? It stands for silent but deadly. Raise your hand if you have ever experienced an S B D. Maybe not yourself, but maybe you've noticed someone else <laughs> around experienced an S B D. My question to you is how did you know it? How did you know someone near you experienced an SBD? Yeah, you smelled it, right? And you know the old expression, oh, they who smelt it dealt it. Yeah, or they who exposed it uh, did something else. I, I forget all of those different little uh, limericks. But uh, yeah, you probably knew it because you smelled it. Now... I know this sounds like a disgusting analogy, doesn't it? But all right, let's use something a little bit nicer. Let's say someone is uh, is is using a lovely fragrance in a perfume and uh, they really douse themselves up in the morning with this perfume, maybe a little bit too much, if you know what I mean. And they enter the room. Whoa. Are you going to know it? And if so, how? Yeah, you're going to smell it, right? Why? It is because odors, in addition to other things as well, odors experience diffusion or diffusion. Diffusion, this movement from higher to lower concentration levels, is illustrated very well with odors. You can have, oh my, imagine if I grab that roadkill, that dead skunk I saw on my way in this morning. Imagine if I brought that into school in a bag inside a bucket to seal it up real well, and I had it with me right now while you're listening to this video, and I opened up the container. Do you think you detect that I had a dead, decomposing, stinky skunk? Eventually, you sure would. And uh, who would discover it first, me or you? <laughs> yeah, me, I would. Why? Because I'm closest to it. The concentration of nasty odor would be closest to me. 
the highest concentration would be in that bucket in the bag or the bag in the bucket that I would have right here. That's where it would be most heavily concentrated, the highest concentration. There would be no concentration initially out by you, but I open up that bucket, open up that bag, and before you know it, the whole room will be enjoying that lovely odor of decomposing skunk. Why? Because that odor, just like materials in cells, move without any energy input, move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. High concentration near me first, low concentration by you, but it would move out until it filled up the entire room evenly. How lovely would that be? Don't worry. I wouldn't even dream of doing that because I really can't stand the odor of skunk. But let me show you something else. No, not a skunk and not something really stinky. Well, let's come over to the lab again here for a moment. And I have a beaker. In fact, it is a beaker of water. And in this beaker of water, there's nothing right now but water. It's pretty simple, pretty easy to see. So let me put a paper, ah, yes. Let me put a paper towel behind it so that we can see it even better. But we've got this beaker of water with nothing in it except water. But I have something else over here as well. I have some red food coloring. Can you see that? Yeah, some red food coloring. And I'm not going to bump this beaker. I'm not going to do anything to the beaker. I'm just going to let it sit here. I'm not going to add any energy to it. But I'm going to add one drop of red food coloring into this beaker. Oops. Hey, get back up there. Let me hold that up with a sponge here. There we go. We want to be able to see that. Is that good? All right. That's good. So I'm going to open up this red food coloring. And I'm going to put one drop of food coloring in the middle of this water in the beaker. And I just want you to watch. Bloop. All right. And as you watch, you see a greater concentration sinking down to the bottom in that beaker. And along the top, you see it has spread out. What we are observing here, slowly but surely, is the diffusion of red food coloring. Now, imagine if this beaker were representing a cell and this red food coloring is representing some type of a nutrient that this cell required. Well, that nutrient might be exposed to the cell membrane illustrated by the surface of the water. And if it's something that the cell needs, that cell membrane would allow that nutrient in. And that nutrient would come into the cytoplasm of the cell. And because of diffusion, that cell would allow that nutrient to permeate the entire cell so that whatever organelles might need that nutrient, whatever it might be, would be allowed to permeate the cell and be able to be absorbed and utilized, undergo metabolism, and the cell would be a happy critter, okay? And that would make the organism happy as well. So in just this brief time that I have spent talking about this, you can see that that one drop of food coloring has now diffused throughout the entire beaker of water representing a cell. Isn't that kind of cool? I think that's kind of cool. Diffusion at work. This is a lot more enjoyable than the other example of me bringing in a dead skunk. Wouldn't you agree? All right, let's head back to our notes. Oh, here we are back in our notes. So diffusion, again, can take place in the context of odors, liquids, other substances as well, for that matter. Uh, but, uh, but those are great examples. Odors and liquids help us to visualize what is happening on a cellular level 
on a level that we just can't really see without magnification. So we'll finish up diffusion here with this illustration, this diagram, which is in your book. And it just shows an area of high concentration represented by all of these red spheres. And these red spheres can represent anything. They don't have to be just little sponge balls like I have here. Oh, isn't that cool? Whoa, the little red ball is about the, same, whoop, about the same size as these red spheres. So again, with diffusion, you don't have to throw the little red spheres from one side to another, although I'm going to do that right now. Whee! Okay. But rather, diffusion occurs without any energy input. High concentration to low concentration. So diffusion. Any questions about diffusion? All right, let's move on then to number four, which is, I think, is a really cool science word. It's one of those words that you just can't say normally. I just can't. And so I want you to repeat after me the word osmosis. Can you say that word with me? Osmosis. Now say it just like I said it. Oh, come on. I know you can do better than that. Let me say it again for you. Osmosis. Say it for me. All right. Nice job. So what is osmosis? Osmosis is a special type of diffusion. In fact, osmosis is the diffusion of water into or out of a cell. And this is a very, very important thing because if you remember from the other day, we talked about the basic needs of living things, water being one of those basic needs. Water is so vitally important because water is required for all those chemical activities to take place. Without water, there's no chemistry. Without any chemistry, there is no life. So osmosis is a really important uh, cellular process. Again, osmosis is the diffusion of water into or out of a cell. Now, let me give you an example of diffusion here. So let's go to our close-up view. Here I have another beaker of water and I quickly took out all of the food coloring so that it would be clear once again. See, it's a clear beaker of water. Isn't that cool? All right, now I've got two cups here, two styrofoam cups. And in one cup, I have poked a bunch of little holes in the bottom of this cup. Can you see them? Poached, poked a bunch of little holes in the bottom of the cup to make this top cup semi-permeable. Ooh, a word from the past. What does semi-permeable mean? All right, semi-permeable. Some things can go through, other things cannot. Remember the strainer? Well, check it out. I have my semi-permeable cup up top and the cup with no holes in it on the bottom. I'm gonna pour water into the top cup. What do you think is going to happen? Now, why do you think the water is gonna drip out of the top cup? Yeah, because it's got a bunch of holes in it, right? Now, am I gonna have to push Whoops. Or force the water through the top cup? Yes or no? No. Gravity's going to do all the work, right? So all I have to do is pour the water into the top cup. Look at that. And it's just coming right out through the bottom holes of the cup, moving all by itself with no added energy. That's kind of an illustration of 
osmosis. Again, osmosis is a special type of diffusion. Remember, diffusion does not require energy. And as we head back to our notes here, you will see that osmosis also, oops, osmosis also does not require any energy. There is no energy input in osmosis. Now, I'm trying to hide something here for a reason, okay? I'll just hide this just like this. Okay, so osmosis, the diffusion of water into or out of a cell, and it requires no energy input. Now, why am I hiding these pictures? All right, I'll show you what these pictures are. Have any of you ever heard of what happens to slugs when you pour salt on them? Raise your hand if you know what happens when you pour salt on a slug. Yeah, it shrivels up and dies. Now, you notice there's a hyperlink here of a video that shows what happens to a slug when you pour salt on it. No, I'm not going to play it right now, because if you did your assignment on Monday, you already saw the video. And if you didn't, you can go back to the notes and watch it if you are really ghoulish uh, and, and want to see a poor slug being dissolved by salt. But I want to tell you the science behind it. And by the way, I'm not condoning this. I'm not saying you should do this. Did you all hear me? Don't go out and find a bunch of slugs and pour salt on them. That would be cruel and unusual punishment to the slugs. But I know many of you have heard of it, and so I want to explain the science to you. Let, uh, let me go get something here. I'll be right back. All right, I have something in my hand here. No, it is not a slug. I don't have a slug in my hand. No, it's just a, it's just the uh, the red squeezy ball. Okay, we're gonna pretend for a moment. You, how many? Raise your hand. How many of you are hoping that I had a slug and a jar of salt that I was going to show you? You people are disgusting. Disgusting. Oh, my goodness. All right. This is going to represent the cell of a slug. All right. And uh, under normal conditions, the cells of any living thing are going to be filled with the cytoplasm and the moisture that keeps them their, their, uh, their, their squeezy shapes. All right. Our cells are like water balloons, in a matter of speaking. Now, in case you didn't know anything about the anatomy of slugs, slugs, as cute as they are, they don't, in fact, this is a snail, not really a slug, because slugs don't have shells. This critter has a shell. This is a snail. A slug is like a snail without a shell. And so their bodies, which are moist and soft and supple, have any of you ever held a slug in your hand? Anybody ever hold a slug? It's like a big loogie in the palm of your hand. It's, it's rather disgusting. Anyway, if you've ever seen a slug, they don't have much protection from the environment. They don't. Their, their whole bodies are exposed to the outside, including the outside layers of cells of their bodies. Now, again, if this were representing the cell of a slug near the outside of the body of a slug and someone were to pour salt on it, well, that salt has a tendency to absorb the water from inside the cell of a slug. Oh, do you want to see this really happening? All right, let's hold on one moment. Let's go back to the close-up view in the lab. Ready? All right. Here, 
I've got a beaker of water in one hand and I have something else in my other hand. Before I show you, let me put up the uh, our little paper towel. There we go. You wanna see what I have in my hand? How many of you are hoping it's a real slug? Disgusting. It's a sponge, okay? I have a draw, oh, now, oh, stop with the disappointment. All right, we gotta keep this G-rated here. So here I have a sponge. And if I put a sponge into a beaker of water, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think? Okay, the sponge is going to get wet, right? Now, do you have to force the water into the sponge? No, let's see what happens here. Hopefully you can see that. Oh, the yellow sponge is almost like a green screen. Oh my goodness, this will be interesting here. Okay, can you see what's happening to the sponge here? Our sponge is literally soaking up all of the water. It is soaking up the water. Now, I'm not forcing it to do that. It is just happening by itself. And the way that is happening is through the process called osmosis. Osmosis is allowing the water to go from an area of high concentration in the beaker to an area of low concentration, namely the sponge. Now, if you can see the sponge at all, it is really expanded where on the side that it got wet on and not so much on the other side. So sorry to disappoint you with no real slugs and salt. You'll have to watch the video if you didn't before. Now I'm dripping water all over the place. Oh my dear, oh my. Okay, but you get the idea. Osmosis, the diffusion of water. All right, let's head back to our notes one final time here. By the way, here's a, a picture of osmosis, and we can see uh, blood cells. Blood cells. Uh, the, the top here are showing blood cells. On the bottom are plant cells. And we can see what happens to cells under different conditions based on water concentrations here. In fact, tomorrow we're going to do a little activity illustrating osmosis uh, with a fruit. Okay. But red blood cells, normal red blood cells look like this. If we have a solution that is with too much water, it can cause the cells to overinflate, basically, with water and explode. Uh, in other conditions, it can cause the cells to shrivel up and die. Well, here's what happens with going, getting back to our friendly slug and the salt. The salt draws out all of the water from the cell of the slug. And consequently, the cells implode. The cells get all of the water sucked out of them and there's nothing left. And so the cell that normally looked like this gets all shriveled up. And it's that shriveled up appearance from the dried cells, kind of like raisins, get shriveled up when you take all of the moisture out of them. That's what happens to all of the cells of a slug. And that's why salt and slugs, they don't like each other. All right, that brings us to our fifth and final cellular process that we're gonna finish up with briefly here now. And it is called Active transport. The other two processes that we've discussed, uh, as you recall, required no energy input whatsoever. But active transport is a bit different. Active transport is the movement of materials into or out of a cell, and typically they refer to a cell getting rid of its waste material, getting rid of its waste material.
So the movement of material into or out of a cell typically happens when a cell gets rid of its waste material. Okay, uh, what a lovely thought. And if you were that little boy wanting to get rid of your waste material, it might not require much energy, but well, all right, let's not talk more about that example. Because here's the deal, active transport on a cellular level does require energy. It requires energy. Active transport requires energy. And think about it, it's in the context of waste material. If a cell did not expel its wastes from its structure, the wastes would build up to a point where the cell would explode with waste material. So a cell has got to get rid of that waste material. Let's go up to a close-up view here of an example I like to use for active transport. Two examples here real quick. Anybody know what this is? It is a paper football. And a paper football will just sit in between my fingers and do absolutely nothing until I do something to it. Namely, I flick it. I can flick the paper football and boing! Oh, I made it into the cup. Oh, I wish you were here to see that. That is so cool. You have to actively propel a paper football to get it to go from one place to another. Here's another example. I've got a track and a car. Well, a track and a car. And uh, yes, I could lift up this track and make the car move, or I could pull this device back. Oh yeah, the little flicking device. And it's hooked up to a rubber band. And pushing down on the button, boing, makes the car fly to the other side actively. Active transport requires energy in order for it to take place. Let's head back to our notes for our last slide, which is a picture here showing the cross section of a cell membrane. And the cell membrane has these little structures that act like a doorway and they require energy to expel wastes from the body of a cell. So active transport requires energy. And, and, and on that happy note, we're done with our notes and tomorrow we'll do an activity and a lab activity. We're gonna do a couple activities tomorrow. And until then, I'm gonna say bye-bye. <laughs>